What I'd like to do is first get a bit of a, an analysis before we go to talk policy. Why don't we go to you, Taylor, first, sure. to give us a little bit of an idea of what, what's the problem that we face? I mean, we've, we've come very far up to now since yeah. 1989. Uh, how are we going to use that, that internet to power the economy now? Okay. At the OECD, we are uh, an international organization that comprises 34 countries. And uh, when I go out and I speak to people, there are three main concerns that we see recently. Number one, the economic crisis is not over. Number two, we have huge unemployment, which is particularly difficult among the youth. And third, we have a demographic tsunami on its way, where we have an aging population and we're going to have fewer and fewer people working to cover this. What we see at the OECD is that the internet can actually um, help address all three of these points, but what we'll need is productivity growth. So really the focus across the OECD right now is how do we build productivity growth and how do we leverage the internet in order to do that? I think there are three, essentially three key things that we need to focus on. Number one, how can we use the internet to help SMEs and entrepreneurs? What can we do to, to decrease the barriers of entries for these companies and help them grow once they're in place? I think the second item is how do we teach the skills that are necessary for people to run these businesses, for users, and also for people who are displaced in their jobs because of the internet, they'll need to be retrained and reskilled. How do we leverage the internet to do that? Reskilled by, re by whom? By governments or by companies or both? By both. By so, both. So I, I think the internet's a great tool. It needs to be in formal education. It also needs to be in, um, in other fora. And then finally, I think um, uh, what's really important is that we, we leverage the internet for job matching to make markets more efficient. So for example, that people who are looking for work can find employers who are looking for employees. So I think that's another area where we can leverage. So the internet is going to be a key part of the solution for bringing productivity to countries. Uh, Rafael, let me ask you, uh, there's a skills gap, there's a, a gap in internet uh, penetration, um, there is a lack of um, uh, uh, openness within the single market. Um, how, how to attack that issue? How to attack that issue? Well, first of all, good afternoon. Good question. You know, probably it's a $1 million question. I mean, if we were to uh, have an answer immediately, we wouldn't have these problems in Europe and we wouldn't be lagging behind in competitiveness when it comes, for example, to the US. But that's exactly what we were thinking about, uh, you know, in the EU. First of all, when it comes to regulation, I mean, there is certain regulation which is obviously needed and advantages in order to create trust. For example, when we talk about uh, protection of data, when we are talking about cloud computing, we need to create trust in Europe. But at the same time, we need to free up the potential which is there in internal market. To do that, for example, when it comes to e-commerce, you know, we have to regulate in a way which is you know, creating the right environment, not too much, not too little, in order to boost up that potential. You've said something about the question of a gap in accessibility. I mean, this is one of the things that I do in the European Parliament. Uh, I work, uh, I represent the EPP, which is the Christian Democratic you know, umbrella party in the European Parliament, when it comes to the work on a directive uh, which is aimed at actually increasing accessibility in Europe. There is like a huge potential. I mean, Americans have calculated it's around $300 billion that they're losing because older people, people with disabilities, do not have access to internet. I and mean, if we talk about exclusion now in the 21st century, that's exactly what we should focus our attention to. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are doing in the European Parliament, trying to free up that potential in order that we can actually, you know, catch up when it comes to competitiveness with the rest of the world. Okay. Um, let's, let's go to Jan. Jan, uh, you... Can you, can you give a, an idea of how, within the V4, there can be uh, cooperation to attack these issues? Thank you very much as well. Uh, hello to everybody, or good afternoon here in Warsaw. I, um, I will start with uh, political reflection. On the upper floor, there are four prime ministers plus one. And uh, the fifth one is from Japan. Mm. I dare to say he wouldn't come if the four are not together. So Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, and 
smallest but beautiful Slovakia in the middle, <laughs> is a good uh, offer. It's a portrait or picture of the region which is dynamic, interesting, in the middle of why do you take European space or international global space? And I think uh, together means synergy, not only mathematics, but added value. What would you like to see them decide up there today? For example, when it there, comes to the internet, that there are some strategic issues where Japan and Central Europe have a common view or uh, interests. And I think that there are so many. Uh, one of them was, for example, co connected and is connected to Euro, European currency, which is Slovak currency as well. So it's a specific uh, issue here because Eurozone and the European currency is a global one, more and more. And there are so many other issues like internet, uh, global um, situation. And Vis Visegrad 4 or Visegrad cooperation was the answer uh, in 1991 after collapse of uh, communism on the past and future. I mean, two parts of the message or homework was demontage of the past, Comecon and, and Warsaw Pact, mm. and construction of a new Europe. The first one is more or less done, the second is here. And new Europe means not only a geography or a common market, but real competitiveness and combination, which, what I like to say here, of um, modernity and identity. We keep what we are, uh, we don't want to become a melting pot. Uh, we, we preserve diversity, mm. but we want to be a, a global actor. And this balance is needed and call for innovations. Later, who's on laptop, they say in Germany. So combination of what we need, what we know, and uh, ability to, to compete on, the, on a global scale. I think that Visegrad 4 uh, and innovations are uh, uh, huge uh, challenges. I mean, th there was a, a, a graph from Minister showing and saying where we are. I think that potential is for much more. That uh, um, enter, uh, the, the business environment here, opportunities for foreign direct investment, but also credibility of this region is, is a good condition and, and precondition mm -hmm. for making Visegrad uh, countries front runners in digitization and internetization and innovations. Then let's, let, let's talk about, you, you mentioned foreign direct investment, FDI. Yeah. Interesting that Poland was number two in job creation in the EU last year. This is according to, um, this is according to uh, Ernst Young. They created 13,000 jobs uh, f through foreign direct investment. Uh, that this, the Central and Eastern Europe are making a comeback. That's the positive side. On the other hand, there's a lot more to do. We've got lagging GDP. Many of the countries within the VV4, they're around 1% uh, or less growth. Uh, there's also very high unemployment. In Slovakia, 14.5, right? Uh, Poland, 10.8. Hungary, 10.6. Uh, the Czech Republic, 7.2. That's a little better. How do you attack that through the internet? How can you m leverage the internet to try to encourage SMEs and empower SMEs to do that? I think that the accession of these countries into uh, European community was a must, but uh, not uh, enough for you know, making them really fully competitive and modern and uh, more involved in, in social cohesion. Uh, the answer, in my eyes, usually comes via education. Uh, I think education is a tool which may, helps people to be uh, uh, active citizens, to be aware about the cultural differences, identities, values, but also more and better employable and employed. But uh, here I see mostly a gap between the needs and the realities, and it's a call for more modernity, modernization, uh, focus on, on uh, uh, the output of education process. And secondly, what was enough 10, 20 or 30 years ago is not enough today. Lifelong learning is the answer. Without lifelong learning, there is not lifelong earning. So That uh, needs to be promoted on a national level, on a European level. The way how we teach, the content, what we teach, yeah. uh, and the practicality or practical dimension of education and training is today a criterion for employability. Peter, you're the startup guy here on the panel and very successful. 
let's discuss a little bit that skills gap. How, do you face a skills gap with your company? Um, yes, there are skills gaps, but there are skill gaps everywhere. So, so that, that wouldn't be my primary focus. I, I, I think also besides education, I think the role of role models is actually really, really important. So, What do you mean uh, by that? Yeah, me personally, uh, my family is from Hungary, but I actually was born and raised in Sweden. And, and it's actually uh, very interesting for me to see uh, how all of the positive role models that I had growing up in Sweden, everywhere from Alfred Nobel to, you know, the modern uh, entrepreneurs of Niklas Sandström in Skype, for example, has really, mm -hmm. of course, influenced my thinking in, in um, thinking it's possible, right? Mm. And I think that has been very inspirational for me as I was uh, building Prezi. And, and, you know, bringing out uh, success stories of, of young people who have, in a very ethical way, driven for global success and made it, I think is actually really, really important. That's also why we at Prezi started a foundation called Bridge Budapest, where we've uh, gathered the three biggest um, startups of Hungary. And these are actually quite big, but even in Hungary, they're not that known. So, so it's Logmin, Ustream, and, and, and Prezi. And, and what we want to do is to um, give young people a chance to experience what it's like to work at these companies, but also at Facebook. Um, we work with Twitter um, and many other companies to really give people a chance to look at what it's like accomplishing your dreams, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And so, unfortunately, I don't think that the current schooling system is really good at that. And, and neither are we very good in, in, um, in Europe in telling these stories in the media and celebrating these successes. So as I mentioned to you, just in Hungary with these three companies, um, very few people in Hungary actually know of these companies, even though they have the biggest portion of, of, of uh, uh, the employees in Hungary and they're making global success around the world with a few hundred million users if you add up all of the uh, users that these um, companies have. Okay, you're a successful startup, but what other obstacles do you face? Tell these policymakers here what you need from them. What do they need to do to make your life easier and the life of other startups easier so they can power that economy right. through the internet? Well, I think it's really important to recognize that actually the prime responsibility lies with the entrepreneurs, and it doesn't lie <laughs> with the policymakers, actually. So uh, I hope that there is plenty of entrepreneurs here today that are thinking, I'm going to go for it. Because at the end of the day, you know, uh, policies and laws can only do so much. And, and building that globally successful company is going to depend on you. Uh, what policymakers can do is, I, I think, first of all, is, again, promoting the success stories that exist in the region. What about financing? What about regulation? What about labor laws? What yeah, about I, I think all of those are really secondary things in my perspective. I, I think Prezi is a great example of, despite any challenges that the policies might pose to us, we, we've, you know, that has not limited, I think, uh, our, our success. So, um, but they, they were complications for you. Or not? There were complications, but there are complications on every market. So, um, so I think the really important thing is to have a sense of optimism and a long-term perspective for what you can do if you, if you, uh, you know, really go for, think about what you can do in 10, 15, 20 years. And, and, and by the way, this is something that policymakers really could help in, I think. Sometimes politics tends to be, you know, to the next election. And, and, and I think really uh, building a vision for what our countries can be like <coughs> in 15 and 20 years is something that we will need to spend more time on. On, on that note, if I can add uh, one more thing, I was, I was um, asked to talk in Brussels uh, last year about innovation. 
uh, and what Europe can do. And, and before going there, I actually looked up um, just the, the 30 biggest IT companies on, by market capitalization, right? Mm. And, and it was interesting to do that exercise because I think 17 of them were American, I think seven or nine were Asian, and can you guess how many were European? How many? Two, three. Three. Oh. Maybe you can guess which three it is. <laughs> I'll leave it for you. So, so it was Nokia, it, it was SAP, and Ericsson. Um, and, and I think he, here is something where policymakers need to actually wake up and, and really notice the challenge there, because uh, if we in Europe don't manage to build uh, these um, local champions, then for a company like Skype, for example, that recently exited to Microsoft, you know, it's, it's, it's no wonder that, you know, out of 30 companies, they end up in the US, right? Because at the end of the day, what choice did they have if they wanted to get a global distribution for their services? Well, they had three choices, but it's 10% of, of the mm -hmm. top 30 um, um, in the world. And so, so, so the, the whole um, need for the long-term perspective, the 10, 20 years perspective of how we build competitive economies here okay. is really needed. And, and the consequences can be dire if we don't start building these, these global champions here. Okay, I want to go quickly to Rafael because you, you wanted to say something. And, and we want to send this out to the audience as well. So uh, get, get your questions ready. I want to get you involved as well. Rafael. No, I just wanted to say that you know, whenever I meet entrepreneurs, startups and so on, they always say, like, when I ask what can we do as policymakers, they say, just don't create additional obstacles. Mm. You know, we're going to do it on our own. Get out of our way. But I get out of our, yeah, exactly. But <laughs> I profoundly disagree. Because uh, mm. uh, you know, when I study Israel, for example, that's the biggest success when it comes to uh, startups. Mm. I mean, there's really tons of things we have to do in Europe. And some of it is also the responsibility of the policy okay, like what? Like what? For example, I mean, the, 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 the problem is when you look at the Israelis, I mean, they, and just as Mr. Drummond was saying, there's a culture of actually uh, allowing for risk-taking. Risk mm -hmm. and, and we're not doing it anywhere. I mean, when, it, when, when we talk about our education, I mean, risk-taking is discouraged. My daughter is eight, so I know what I'm talking about because mm -hmm. I'm not talking about my own education, but nothing has changed. Uh, when, when we are talking about, for example, the question of EU funds and EU money, I mean, how they were constructed 2007, 2013, you know, like donations and so on and so forth. Again, risk-taking was not encouraged. Right. It was exactly the opposite to the American example. Whereas now we are thinking about, you know, giving credits, you know, giving guarantees. That kind of changes the whole model. That's okay, and this but is, uh, yeah, I think we, our, our discussion, you said there should be more risk sharing. Right? Uh, risk sharing, but what I'm saying is that we have to change the philosophy of the things we're doing. Also with regulation. I mean, look, I mean, we're, we're coming out of the crisis, so we were doing everything in order to protect our markets, in order not to use fancy uh, financial instruments. But if we were talking about venture capital, I mean, we need to encourage, you know, venture capital to actually come to Europe and to have quite flexible conditions. Now we are doing it in the European Union with the Directive of Venture Capital. But I mean, mm -hmm. there is a question of creating the regulatory environment, which is going to actually allow us to and allow our SMEs to succeed. I mean, sometimes, of course, it, we have to regulate, like on data protection. Right. And, but sometimes this regulation helps us to actually free up the potential of, of, of the market. I'm just going to give you two examples. If, if, if you were talking about e-commerce, I mean, people don't do it cross-border because they're not sure whether the guarantee from France is going to work in Poland. Mm -hmm. I mean, so if we are regulating uh, the questions of, of consumer protection and, you know, we are giving one guarantee in Europe, it propels growth. It allows to actually free up the potential of, of internal market. It's not only about blocking things as people usually think about the European Union in terms of entrepreneurship. It's removing those And barriers. the second example is, is exactly accessibility. I mean, we, for 12 years, the European Commission was trying to encourage that with soft measures. It didn't work, because people were not used to thinking about that as a potential for freeing up potential of internal market. Everyone was thinking about, okay, disabilities, this is about exclusion, and so on and so forth. No. I mean, this is about internal market. That's what we're doing now. 
I mean, this is about 80 million people who have no access to internal markets. Yeah. So sometimes it's regulation. If you think about it differently, if you think out of the box, can actually free up the potential and create more possibilities for, for entrepreneurs. Jan, you wanted to add something. I else. wanted to add, uh, I mentioned at the first point that education is, is, a, is a must, is a, is a call for doing better and more. And the, the uh, positioning of businesses, which Peter mentioned, uh, proves that we have a gap in not so much knowledge, maybe, but rather in transfer of knowledge into uh, enterprise, into uh, practical output. And this is the problem in Europe. I think that uh, one of the answers is think small first principle. Uh, when we think about how to help small, how to start, mm -hmm. how to uh, transfer something into a, a nucleus, then we think also for the big companies. Uh, and this principle is needed uh, in Slovakia, in all countries, because uh, they really start something new, innovative. And, and the second is, let's create space for European champions, not only national, Slovak, Polish, but European. And with the European space uh, market, we can make a difference worldwide. Okay. Uh, just, uh, Taylor, yeah. just quickly, if I can yeah. add a statistic here. Right. I think we tend to think about the ICT sector when we talk about starting businesses online. But the ICT sector accounts for roughly 7% of, of businesses and of output in, in the OECD. So what really needs to change is the mentality outside of the, of the IT sector. Um, if I can just give you a quick statistic. If we look at the number of businesses with more than 10 employees that are connected to the internet in the OECD, it's nearly all of them. We're up around 100%. You say, how many of those have a web page? You're around 50%. And you say, how many of those have actually sold something online? You are below 20%. So I think that's an area where we that's need to focus strong. because it's a big part of the yeah. economy. And it's an area where people don't feel comfortable moving onto the internet, but should. OK, so how do you do that? So I think you need to start making uh, companies aware of what's available and you need to have places that they can get the training. I mean, one of the fantastic things was if you wanted to run your, an email server, let's say you had email in your company 10, 15 years ago, typically you would have to hire someone to put a server in your office, manage it, and take care. Now with cloud computing, you can outsource almost everything onto the internet and just take care of your business focus at home. And I think most entrepreneurs, most SMEs don't realize that. Okay. Any questions out there? We have uh, five minutes left. The time has really flown. Is there any questions? Okay. What? Let's uh, let's go over to. Sorry. We have a question. Friend, uh, ah, yes. We have a microphone. Please identify yourself, sir. Robin Barnett, British ambassador to Poland. Um, but in a previous life, I was quite involved in the creation of uh, the uh, umbrella for Tech City in uh, London, yeah. um, but I'm, I'd like to go back to an issue that's been very much raised here, and that is a very good point was made that actually it's entrepreneurs that have got to create. Um, one or two have challenged uh, that and said actually government has a role. But actually, for me, the big challenge in Tech City was how to bring a bureaucrat in a suit and an entrepreneur together and actually produce something that added value, and I'd welcome any thoughts from the panel on how to do that. How to do that? Who would like to contribute? When I was commissioner, I established uh, EU uh, Business University Forum. I thought it's, it's a kind of um, uh, step towards uh, more intense cooperation, and it was, and it is. Uh, in Europe, the, there are sort of separate, even, even divided worlds of academia, of business, we tend to comment the situation or lament over the problems. When you put these people together, they, they, they very quickly find common interests and even the ways how to deal with the problems. And that's uh, something what we need to develop on all levels and in all countries, business and uh, schools or academia together, regularly, openly, constructively. I mean, first of all, it's one of the priorities of the new innovation policy of the European Union. But also, I mean, when it comes, you know, I'm from Warsaw and I try to help out here uh, the people, the city council. I mean, there are quite a few wonderful initiatives, for example, Smart Cities, which is all about that. And, you know, I could go on, but we don't have much time. But I mean, that's exactly what we are doing with the Euro Cities, with, you know, a grouping of cities in Europe. 
uh, with universities, with entrepreneurs. I mean, because without that link, it's not going to work. Okay. What factors can be the main innovation drivers in the V4? What factors would help you to drive innovation, Peter? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the answer to your question is actually connected to what you were saying. And, and, and for me, really, it all comes back to a cultural shift, not so much in a policy shift. And I believe the only way to unlock that cultural shift is to, to bring forth this positive role model. So that's why I was mentioning um, um, that before. I think one of the reasons why bureaucrats don't pay so much attention to these companies right now is because we failed to tell the interesting story around these companies and the potential that these companies have. So, um, for example, you know, just in the case of Prezi, right now we have 110 uh, employees in Budapest, but we have employees from 25 different countries who has actually joined from Asia, US, South, uh, South America. And I think that there is a story to be told there, for example, on how Budapest can actually be competitive on a global scale, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if we recognize those stories, stories that we hear uh, probably around Facebook all the time, but we don't hear from companies uh, in, in Europe, I think we could create much more excitement. We mm -hmm. could get young people who want to become entrepreneurs. We will get the, the politicians who wants to be associated with these, you know, companies of high growth. And, and we can just generally create a culture of more um, risk-taking. Okay. So, Taylor, from, from the government side, and you represent a lot of governments, uh, I mean, indirectly, um, what could be the government role to try to promote uh, innovation and the internet? I, I think one of the things we need to do is uh, bring down barriers to starting a company. I have a friend um, who started his own company actually selling goods on Amazon. He wanted to enter into the European market and he, was, he had to come in and actually set up a bank account uh, in Europe. Even though he was selling out of the UK, he needed a, a bank account denominated in euros, even though he was based in, a, in the UK. I think we need to bring down those types of barriers, make it easier for people to start businesses. We need to make it easier for people to exit businesses and fail. Uh, in, in some countries, bankruptcy laws will wipe you out for seven years or more. What where about you regulation, tax? In terms of tax is always a big issue. We need to make it easier for you to take in clients from abroad because we need to move towards a, a unified market if at all possible here in Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions out there? We have, oh gosh, we have one minute left. Yes. Can you stand up and introduce yourself? Oh, you got two. Oh. There we go. Yes. My name is Piotr Pacevic. I'm, I'm a journalist. And the question is uh, whether do you still believe in this neoliberal model? We started our transformation with a very strong belief in private entrepreneurship and, you know, that it will save the world. And uh, do you see that the source of innovation is in this area of social activity or you s see some other areas like public domains and uh, education and all that? Well, well, that's, that's a big question. I think we're going to go to the policymakers. Rafael. Uh, as you know, our prime minister even said that he's a little bit social democratic in his heart. But I think that, you know, in Western Europe, uh, there is a saying, if you are not a socialist when you were 20, you are going to be a pig when you're going to be 40. In Poland, it's, it's the other way around. Like, we were crazy liberal. I'm 42. We were crazy liberals in 89, you know, believe, believing in free market and nothing else. Now, I mean, we're changing. We're re reverting. And, and, and obviously, when it comes to regulation, it's there to create the right environment and free up the potential of the people. But there's a lot also when it comes to the potential of the public domain and so on and so forth. We're all changing in our thinking throughout. But, I mean, it's exactly the rather other way around than it is in the West. Okay, I'm so um, sorry we're all out of time. I think that, quickly. that yes. uh, freedom, if it is to, to be sustained, needs a responsibility. These countries especially, they, they went from uh, oppressive collectivism into many times uh, kind of unlimited individualism. And I think that Middle, rope, uh, middle Road uh, speaks about uh, freedom and responsibility. 
uh, person, human person, dignity and common good as, as an objective and criterion and, and, and the road towards future. And I think that one of the greatest real, not perfect, but real examples of this approach is European Union. It is innovation. It never existed before, before the Second World War. It is there for 60 years. It may be still there 10 years after, or I mean later. It depends on our approach to crisis, the problems, the, the, the challenges. And I think that common approach brings better answers, more balanced, more European. And I think that's also important contribution of Visegrad countries and all countries together.